So this is the first of several video segments on international trade. And in this first segment, I'm going to start with just some basic facts about international trade, because I think people have a lot of beliefs about international trade, but those beliefs are often sort of not grounded in hard facts. So one thing to look at here is people have a lot of questions and concerns and beliefs about the trade balance. And the trade balance is exports minus imports. And if that's a negative number, if imports are greater than exports, then we have a trade deficit. And if it's the other way around, if exports are greater than imports, then we have a trade surplus. And as you can see here, the U.S. basically has been running trade deficits since pretty much forever, with a small exception here right after World War II, when, of course, much of the rest of the world um, was destroyed and was still recovering. So we did export more than we imported, um, as other people wanted machinery from us to rebuild and couldn't produce um, consumption goods themselves. So the idea that the U.S. has been running a trade deficit only recently is pretty much just not true. Um, as we can say here, going all the way back to 1929, through the 50s, through the 60s, 70s, 80s, etc. Here, um, There is a period here in the middle of the first decade of the 2000s where it does become larger. There are also some other periods here where it becomes exceptionally large in sort of the middle of the 80s, and it becomes exceptionally large in the late, mid-90s. And what we tend to notice here, actually, is that these periods where it becomes exceptionally large are basically because the United States is in an economic boom and people are spending a lot compared to what they um, have as income because they're very optimistic about the future. People often think that the U.S. doesn't export anything successfully. And I think part of the reason for that is that if you look at what we export and what we import, we export a lot of capital goods. And these are things that individual households typically don't buy. So we don't really think about them as being businesses out there. But these are great big things like bulldozers and generators for hydroelectric dams and commercial aircraft and that sort of thing. <clears throat> we also actually export a lot of sophisticated intermediate um, goods. So we might import crude oil and then export refined petroleum products. On the other hand, what do we import? We import mainly consumer goods and things like crude oil and other raw materials. In the global scheme of things, although you can see that the U.S. has become more globalized in this chart because imports and exports are both growing relative to GDP, this is imports relative to GDP and exports relative to GDP, in a global context, the U.S. isn't very globalized. So we often want to look at imports and exports relative to GDP for different countries, and we can see that the U.S. is not very globalized. China is also not very globalized. And these smaller countries, Belgium, Canada, which is small in terms of people, and Germany, etc., are typically more globalized than larger countries like the U.S. or China. And a lot of this simply becomes a matter of, well, there's only room for a few industries to really grow and prosper in a small country, but a large country like the U.S. or China can support multiple firms in the same industry and so will not typically be importing as much. <clears throat> Again, sort of getting back to this idea, there's this popular belief, I think, out there that the U.S. doesn't make anything anymore. And what this chart shows is what's happened to manufacturing output over time. So sort of starting back here in the mid to late 80s, we can see that manufacturing output grew all the way up to here. These shaded bars represent recessions, so not very surprisingly, manufacturing output declines in a recession, starts growing again, then we get a recession, and since the recession ended, manufacturing output has actually increased quite substantially, sort of gone up by about 
um, and has almost recovered to its pre-recession peak. And still, you know, if you sort of even out the recessions, it's still true that we're hitting a slightly higher peak after each recession than before it. I think the reason why people have this belief that nothing is made in the U.S. anymore is because there are fewer manufacturing jobs. That is definitely going to be true. Again, if we take as our baseline things in sort of the middle 1980s, what's going on with the manufacturing labor force is that it's in slow decline at first and then faster decline, especially during periods of recession. Um, it recovers a little bit here, but I'm not sure that I would expect that to counteract the overall general long-run trend. Now, of course, if manufacturing output is stable or increasing, and manufacturing employment is falling, the reason has to be that manufacturing productivity is growing. So that's how we're able to get stable or increasing amounts of manufacturing output from a declining manufacturing workforce. And fundamentally, it's that increase in productivity which has led to a smaller number of jobs in the manufacturing sector. The same thing happened historically with the farm sector, of course. Once upon a time, 80 or 90 percent of the population used to be farmers, but eventually farm productivity, labor productivity in agriculture, increased so much that it only took a smaller fraction of the labor force to produce enough food for everyone. So nowadays we have about one or two percent of the US labor force engaged in agriculture. And in my perspective, essentially that's what's going on with manufacturing. We're having manufacturing product productivity continue to grow. And essentially, rather than take that as more and more manufactured goods, we're mostly taking that as, well, let's take a similar, maybe slightly greater amount of manufactured goods, but instead we want people to be in those service occupations. And service occupations, remember, aren't just flipping burgers. That could be people who are going out there and performing health care. It could be people who are performing legal services. It could be people who are doing web design or something like that. All of those are going to go ahead and be service occupations.